Okay, so welcome back. <laughs> I'm Carlos from Amazon Web Services. And uh, so today we are going to talk about uh, media sharing platforms on the Amazon Cloud. So the typical examples of uh, media sharing, if we talk of it globally, it's, uh, for example, Vimeo. Vimeo is, uh, is a video sharing website. So you upload your videos and you can share them with your community. Another typical example that runs on Amazon is uh, SlideShare. So SlideShare allows you to share your presentations or your documents with the community. So all these, uh, these websites have something in common. They have the same problems, they have the same scaling issues, the same storage problems, and uh, they also have the same uh, success. So this is an example of the, the growth of the number of visitors in SlideShare. So you can see that, I mean, okay, they started in this diagram from uh, 1.5 million, but at some point they started from nothing, right? So what, the point that I want to make during this presentation is building a website that sustains several millions of users, it's an iterative process. So you, you don't build a website that sustains millions of players right from the spot, right? This is something that evolves, this is something really iterative. So let's go, let's build a, a media sharing website. So let's assume that you have the first part, you, you did the, 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 the software, you did the, the prototype, everything is great. So first of all, you need to, uh, you need to host your, your system. So to, for hosting, we have a service called Amazon EC2. So this is our most popular service. So basically what is EC2 is a collection of uh, a family of virtual servers that you use to do, I mean, virtually anything. You have completely full administrator access to these machines. And uh, to give you a best definition, this is the, the pricing. So there is no upfront cost. So it's like buying a book on Amazon. So here it's Amazon Web Services. So you see that there's a slightly different price between the Linux instances and the Windows instances because on the Windows servers, we include the license cost. But otherwise, this is the idea. You need a, a virtual server, you just pay for the hour. Even if you take like a, a, a quadruple extra large cluster machine, that is something that, I mean, personally I will never buy, right, because it's hugely too expensive. So these kind of machines, you can have them cheaply for like two bucks per hour, right? So there's no, there's no uh, investment fee. You don't have to pay something like to open an account and you don't have to pay anything to, to remove your account. So when you create an instance, this is what you have, like a, a, a server. So the only thing that you, you have to plug it to make it running is, uh, uh, an elastic IP, a free service, and why not a, a DNS name? So this is the, the basic setup that you can start. So you can install your Apache server, your PHP application, whatever. You have a, a DNS server that allows your users to go to a, do, a fancy domain name like mygame.com and pointing to the instance. So the elastic IP allows you to redirect the flow to different, uh, different instances. If you remove one instance, you can reconnect the IP address to another one. Okay, so this is, this is basic stuff. So now, the real problem comes when you, have to, uh, when you have a huge number of users. So this is the, where we are going to talk about the concept of elastic hosting. So here's the typical story. So you have, a, you have an amazing game, right? You are very proud of it. You release it. Uh, your players are, love it. I mean, this is an amazing game. Uh, but suddenly, everyone wants to use it, right? So the traditional way, uh, you have to think of capacity planning. And, and this is something really difficult, right? I mean, imagine you have a game and you are going to launch it tomorrow. How many players are you going to have uh, in the first two months, right? I mean, this is difficult, right? And if you don't know how many players you are going to have, then how many servers are you going to allocate? How many bandwidth do you need, right? So this is a tough question. To, to answer, and especially where another factor comes into play, like how much money do you have, right? So even worse, that is all these servers, all this capacity, you have, to, you have to manage it somehow. So you still have the problem, you build your game, but now you will have to buy uh, capacity, you will have to buy servers, you have to install not only servers, but switches, uh, firewalls, routers, whatever comes with, uh, with these machines, right? So, one thing to keep in mind when you work on the Amazon cloud is when you turn off resources, you stop paying for them. Okay, so I showed you that EC2 servers, EC2 instances, you pay them by the hour. If you need a server just for one hour, it's okay. You just pay a few cents and you get your server. 
But if you try to do it with this with uh, your traditional machine that you bought, I mean, if you shut it down, you just save on the electricity bill. You already paid the machine, right? So I mean, okay, you can save on the electricity bill, but that's not so much, right? And it, it gets even worse when you have unpredictable patterns. Like uh, we have one of our customers uh, who build a game, uh, a mobile game on, uh, on Facebook. And uh, a few days after launch, they have more than 2 million users. So pretty successful game, right? But of course, they, they, they were not prepared to, to see that. So oh, fortunately, they run on, on the Amazon cloud and they could scale and they could add the ca enough capacity in order to sustain this huge number of users. But you can also have the other part, that is you can have extremely predictable patterns, right? So for example, if you go to London, uh, to the Trafalgar Square, you will see this uh, big clock that shows you how much time is left be uh, before the Olympic Games will start. So maybe you have a, a game that will, uh, that will be playable only during the Olympic Games, so you, you know precisely when you will have your, your hotspots, right? So during the, the three weeks or during the month of the Olympic Games, you will have your game on. And this is something that is al also work for like uh, marketing campaigns, like uh, uh, whatever brand is launching a new product so they can have a, a, a game for two weeks. Right? So and this will be completely silly to buy hardware just for launching a game during two weeks. Right? So obviously, the solution will be to go to the Amazon cloud and to use capacity only for this, uh, for this uh, small time. But regarding the scaling, what you really need is, uh, is some kind of, of, of magic button that allows you to, to add and remove capacity depending on what you need. Because of course, it's fancy to add capacity when you have a lot of players. Uh, but I mean, if for example, during the night you don't have players, you, you need to remove this capacity as well. And this is the concept of the, the elastic capacity. So let's see how it works. So you start an EC2 instance on the Amazon cloud so the first thing you can add is a free service called Amazon CloudWatch. So basically, CloudWatch is monitoring on the cloud. So what it, what it will give you is like metrics on how much do you use your CPU, how much bandwidth you consume, and so on. Right? So the other service that you add is another free service called uh, auto-scaling. So auto-scaling is, is a pretty simple uh, but very powerful. It allows you to set up rules for scalability. So here, what you can say is, um, if the CPU usage of my web server goes above 70%, add a new machine. And conversely, if the CPU usage of my web servers goes below 30 or 20%, remove a machine. Okay, so very simple rule. And the last component that you add is a load balancer in front of them. So uh, on the AWS cloud, the name is the Elastic Load Balancing Service. So this is the, the classic setup that you will have for your front end game. So let's see how it works. 6 a.m., you don't have a lot of players. It's okay to run on one machine. 10 a.m., now uh, players are coming to your platform and uh, CloudWatch will detect that the CPU is, uh, is burning. So what it will do is trigger the creation of a new machine. Once the machine is created, the operating system initializes and so on, the load balancer will start distributing traffic to this machine, okay? So this is something that is done automatically, again. And of course, you, are, I mean, you already see the, the idea is uh, uh, 10 p.m. your players start to leave the platform. So uh, the, the CPUs or the bandwidth will start to be consumed uh, way less. So it will go below the 20% limit. So auto scaling will uh, trigger one machine uh, for removal and the load balancer will stop distributing traffic to it. And you are go going back to the initial state. So during the weekends, you can still uh, your stay at home. This is done automatically for you. You don't have to think of provisioning capacity if you have a huge spike and so on. And even worse, I mean, maybe someone is talking about your game on, on Facebook, on TV or whatever, and, and you are not prepared to it, right? But with auto-scaling rules, uh, auto-scaling will add enough capacity to sustain your needs. So of course you can put limits like uh, no more than 20 or 100 servers. And uh, I mean, you can cap your limits and you can control your fleet. But the key here to understand is this is done completely automatically, right? So this is a, cl uh, a classic setup that you have for uh, a web front end. So a DNS, uh, DNS service with an elastic load balancer that distributes load to web servers. Okay, so this is a, uh, just the front end. So now let's see the storage because we are building a media sharing platform. So you upload files to your web servers. 
But obviously, you are not going to store these files uh, on the web server itself. So imagine we are trying to build something like Vimeo. Your, your users are uploading video files. You, you are not going to keep that on the web servers. So the service to use here is Amazon S3. S3 stands for Simple Storage Service. So it's a, it's a key value storage service uh, on the cloud. So basically what you have is, uh, is a, a, a uniform resource locator to your object that you put on Amazon S3. So S3 allows you to store files from one, one byte to five terabytes with extremely high durability. So this is 11 nines of durability and uh, we achieve this high level because we replicate the files in different data centers and inside different data centers in different racks. So for your users who are uploading uh, videos, movies, sounds, whatever on your media sharing platform, uh, you don't need to do any backup. The backup is, is uh, done by Amazon S3 itself because of the replication process. So this is the, the, uh, the simple architecture diagram. So you have a fleet of web servers that when they receive uh, a file, they put it on Amazon S3 directly. Okay, so for the moment what we have is we just stored raw data that is sent by our users. We didn't do any processing. But if you think of uh, websites like, uh, like Vimeo, you need to do video transcoding, right? You need to transform the raw video files in formats that are, in formats that are viewable by uh, iPads, iPhones, uh, Androids, or whatever. So usually on Vimeo, uh, one video file is transformed into uh, between 12 and 17 uh, different video formats. And if you think of SlideShare, it's the same. That is, you upload, you upload a PowerPoint presentation, you can upload it on the Microsoft Office format, you can upload it on the, on the Keynote format, or you can send a PDF, and uh, SlideShare will transform it into a Flash Viewer application. Right. So you have to do this kind of processing on the back end. So to do some media transcoding, this is an operation that is extremely CPU intensive, usually. Transcoding a video, transcoding a sound, consumes a lot of CPU power. But hey, you're running on Amazon, so you can have like EC2 servers depending on how much you need, right? So this is the architecture that you can set up. So as you can notice, uh, here we are going to separate, uh, this is your website, right? So with a, a load balancer and two web servers and you have another endpoint to upload the files. So you don't, you, uh, you, don't keep the, you don't consume bandwidth from the website on the uploading side. So all the, uploading file, the uploaded files will go to Amazon S3, and the workers here are servers that will do the, the transcoding. So either video transcoding, PDF transformation, whatever on the back end. But this is not very efficient, right? Because the next step is, uh, these machines will start to do uh, polling, like every second they will query Amazon S3 to see, hey, do you have a new file to transcode, for example? So, um, not very efficient. So, a key pattern here is uh, something that is very popular among SOA architectures, is to use a queuing system. So, there's also a service for that on the Amazon cloud, so it's called SQS, Simple Queuing Service. And basically, you add this component here that will queue the messages for the backend processors to say that, uh, here's the list of the different files to process. So the good thing here is that, look, you have an auto-scaling group here. But you can, what you can also do is accumulate in the queue the list of all the video files you will have to transcode, and then start, let's say, 10 super beefed cluster machines on the Amazon cloud for a couple of hours, and transcode all the videos, and then shut down all the machines. Because remember, you just pay by the hour, right? So the SQS queuing system here will, uh, will stack all your messages and you will you'll do the processing by batches. So this way you will, you will have a lot of economies by doing your, your processing. So another component that is uh, handy here is uh, Amazon SimpleDB. So SimpleDB is a, is a NoSQL database that is perfectly suited for storing metadata. So for example, uh, you upload a Vimeo, what kind of, you upload a video file, what kind of metadata you put is like, the creation date, the author, uh, the account, and so on. So the advantage here is that uh, it's not a relational database. You don't have to think of scaling, sharding, and so on. It's pretty simple. You just put the data in, uh, in one big table, and you're ready to go. So we are going to put the simple DB here on the back end. So each time the uh, processing workers will do the transcoding of one file, 
they will update the media store in order to put the, the different metadata. So you still need sometimes a relational database. Maybe you have a blog on the website or maybe you have social features and you need to do like some kind of social graphs or any kind of joints. So I mean, for that you can still use a, a relational database. So Amazon RDS is a, is a pretty slick service that allows you to create a relational database in a few simple clicks. So this is how the interface looks like. So you go to the web console and you can start a MySQL uh, database server in just a matter of seconds. So you see that you choose the, the size, the type of instance, how much storage you need. And I mean, in literally a minute, you have your database server. So you can put your database server uh, on the back end. But one important thing is regarding the data, uh, something that we, we didn't mention so far is to be reliable, your website have to, uh, you have to remove every single point of failure in the architecture. And one feature we provide is a, a, a multi-availability zone database. So if you have a, a database by just clicking this box, what we are going to do in a, in a traditional setup is create a synchronous replica of your database in another availability zone, meaning another separated data center. So if your main database fails, we will redirect the traffic to the other database and your data is still safe and your website is still available. So this is the architecture we have so far with a relational database here in the back. So now, the last step. You start having a lot of users, so you need to deliver the content somehow. So again, there's a service called uh, Amazon CloudFront. So CloudFront is a content delivery network. We have several edge locations around the world, so uh, there's something missing in the diagram. Uh, yesterday, we launched a new edge location in, in uh, Milan and uh, another one in, uh, it was just Milan, Osaka. in Osaka, Japan. So yeah, missing in the diagram as well. So uh, the idea here is that you have these caching edge locations that are close to your users, okay? So the yellow boxes here are the main uh, Amazon Web Services regions. So for example, if you create your infrastructure in Europe, but your users are, yeah, let's say in Brazil, you have this edge location here in Sao Paulo that will cache the content and deliver the files close to, uh, closer to your users. So, so the basic setup, of course, uh, CloudFront is uh, most popularly used in front of Amazon S3, so you can cache the files close to an edge location. And the main benefit also of CloudFront is that uh, is you, it uses uh, Adobe Flash Media Server for, for doing the video streaming. So you can have video streaming of the videos you put on S3 just out of the box without paying licenses for Adobe Flash Media Server, right? All without doing the setup yourself. So this is something that I've been used by uh, a company called uh, AF83. They did the, video the live video streaming of a Madonna concert. So, and of course for that, uh, a concert is what? Just two, three hours, even for Madonna, right? So you don't need to buy the, the hardware and the capacity for just two, three hours, it doesn't make sense. You just go to the Amazon cloud and you have all the tools that you need in order to build an infrastructure that will last for a couple of hours and then you destroy everything and you stop paying for the resources, right? So this is the final architecture that we built so far. So uh, what you can see, I think the, the slides will be available on the, on the website, but what you can see is that there is no single point of failure in this architecture. That's the beauty of the system. All the main components like uh, Amazon S3, SQS, and SimpleDB, the, the larger boxes, are components that are redundant and multi-availability zones. Otherwise, the, the web servers and all the single EC2 instances, your single servers, are monitored by an auto-scaling group. So if one of the servers fails for whatever reason, the auto-scaling group will remove it and recreate another one automatically. So, the key mes message here is that uh, Amazon Web Services is a set of uh, infrastructure building blocks. And you can build whatever system with the Amazon Cloud uh, with these building blocks. But the, uh, the key concept here is that uh, it provides you elastic capacity. So the Amazon platform can adapt to your needs, you can scale up, and more importantly, you can scale down. So this is uh, extremely important for your cost efficiency. Of course, for all the services, even for content delivery, you only pay for what you use. So there's no upfront contract, there's no upfront fee, there's, you don't have to pay anything uh, to get started, right? 
And the main benefit as well is the uh, faster time to market because you don't have to install the machines. You don't have to provision the hardware. You don't have to, uh, you don't have to do the hardware administration yourself. This is, really, this is already done. You want to, an instance, you just go to the web interface, you start it, and you have it in a couple of seconds. So with all these benefits, what you can do is focus on your business, focus in creating great games and great applications. Thank you. So I think we have uh, time for some questions, five minutes for questions. Okay, good. <laughs> so uh, in, uh, we have a five minutes break. Uh, and we, we can without break, just start. <laughs> okay. <laughs> if you want. Uh, well, maybe let's do a five, just a quick break, and then we will, we will continue on uh, uh, the same kind of presentation, but this one, this one, no one for online games, because we saw that, that how you can build a system for uh, media sharing platforms and so on. So you have the key ideas of elasticity and so on for your games. But now we are going to go into more details for specific problems that are only addressed by online games. So just a couple of minutes.